When most people think of the civil rights movement, they think of Martin Luther King Jr., whose I Have a Dream speech delivered on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in 1963 and his acceptance of the Peace Prize the following year secured his place as the voice of nonviolent mass protest in the 1960s. Yet the success of the movement was only possible due to the foundation laid by fiery leaders before him. Among them stands Malcolm X, a man who emerged from the depths of adversity to become one of the most resonant and influential voices of the civil rights movement. His journey, marked by personal transformation and an unyielding commitment to justice, is a testament to the power of resilience and the pursuit of truth. Malcolm X was a different kind of leader, a true trailblazer whose spirit was forged in the face of adversity. Born into a society that sought to confine him, he rose above the limitations imposed upon him, becoming a symbol of resilience and determination. Through his unwavering commitment to civil rights, he paved the way for an entire generation to find their voice, their purpose, and their power. In this video, we will delve into the life and times of Malcolm X, peeling back the layers to reveal a man whose indomitable spirit and unwavering commitment to justice have left an indelible mark on history. From his humble beginnings to his transformative journey of self-discovery, we will witness the evolution of a mind that dared to question and challenge the prevailing narratives of his era. Before we get right into the video, please smash the like button and subscribe to the channel to keep informed of our eye-opening black narrative. In the heartland of Omaha, Nebraska, on the 19th of May, 1925, a child was born into a world fraught with turmoil and inequality. His name was Malcolm Little, and his early life was a tempest of hardship and struggle. His parents, Earl and Louise Little, were brave fighters against racial injustice, and their home was filled with a powerful desire for equality. Little did they know that their son Malcolm would be molded by their unyielding spirit and grow to be a towering figure in the annals of history. His parents faced significant threats to their safety due to their activism against racial injustice. Throughout their lives, they moved several times to escape the reach of white supremacist groups that targeted them. The Ku Klux Klan, or KKK, a notorious white supremacist organization known for its violence and intimidation tactics, was active during that period targeting African Americans who challenged the racial status quo. In the early 1920s, the Littles moved to Milwaukee to escape the oppressive environment in Omaha. However, racial tensions persisted in their new location. Seeking a safer haven, the family moved to Lansing in the mid-1920s. Here they faced continued discrimination and hostility from other supremacist groups like the Black Legion which operated mainly in the Midwest during the 1920s and 1930s. They were responsible for numerous acts of violence, including bombings, arson, and lynchings, all aimed at intimidating and suppressing African Americans and other minority groups. Malcolm X would lose four of his father's brothers due to mysterious circumstances during this period. Racism would strike Malcolm's young life with a cruel force, leaving deep scars that would shape his path forever. Tragically, his father was taken away from him through a senseless and brutal murder, which shattered his world completely. When Malcolm Little was six years old, his father's body was found lying across the town's trolley tracks. The death was ruled accidental, but his mother Louise believed Earl had been murdered by the Black Legion. Louise would be denied a life insurance benefit as the insurer claimed Earl Little had committed suicide to make ends meet. A few years later, his mother suffered a mental breakdown and was institutionalized. Her children, including Malcolm, would be separated and sent to foster homes. He attended West Junior High School in Lansing and then Mason High School in Mason, Michigan, but left high school in 1941 before graduating. He excelled in junior high school, but dropped out of high school after a white teacher told him that practicing law, his aspiration at the time, was no realistic goal for a Negro. These words made Malcolm feel that the white world offered no place for a career-oriented black man, regardless of talent. As a teenager, he moved to Harlem, New York, where he became involved in criminal activities. In 1946, at the age of 21, he was arrested for burglary and sentenced to 10 years in prison. Little did he know that this period of confinement would become a turning point in his life. During his time behind bars, Malcolm immersed himself in reading and education. He devoured books on various subjects, expanding his knowledge and opening his mind to new ideas. It was here that he met fellow convict John Bembry, a self-educated man he would later describe as the first man I had ever seen command total respect with words. 
Under Bembry's influence, he developed a voracious appetite for reading. It was during this transformative period that he discovered the teachings of the Nation of Islam, an organization advocating for black separatism and self-determination. At that time, Malcolm showed scant interest in transforming his life, still caught up in a cycle of self-destructive behaviors. However, his brother Reginald would prove to be a turning point. In his letter, Reginald urged him to make two simple yet profound changes. Quit smoking and stop consuming pork. I'll show you how to get out of prison. These seemingly small adjustments carried significant symbolic weight within the context of the Nation of Islam's teachings. After a visit in which Reginald described the group's teachings, including the belief that white people were destined for divine punishment because of their long-standing oppression of blacks. Malcolm concluded that every relationship he had had with whites had been tainted by dishonesty, injustice, greed, and hatred. Malcolm, whose hostility to Christianity had earned him the prison nickname Satan, became receptive to the message of the Nation of Islam. In late 1948, he wrote to Elijah Muhammad, the leader of the Nation of Islam. Muhammad advised him to renounce his past, humbly bow in prayer to God, and promise never to engage in destructive behavior again. Though he later recalled the inner struggle he had before bending his knees to pray, he soon became a member of the Nation of Islam, maintaining a regular correspondence with Muhammad. Malcolm's embrace of black separatism would shape the debate over how to achieve freedom and equality in a nation that had long denied a portion of the American citizenry and the full protection of their rights. It also laid the groundwork for the black power movement of the late 60s. In 1950, the FBI opened a file on him after he wrote a letter from prison to President Truman, expressing opposition to the Korean War and declaring himself a communist. That year, he also began signing his name, Malcolm X. In his autobiography, Malcolm explained that the it symbolized the true African family name that he could never know. For me, my ex replaced the white slave master name of Little, which some blue-eyed devil named Little had imposed upon my paternal forebears. After his parole in August 1952, he visited Elijah Muhammad in Chicago. From there, he would become a part of the several of the nation's temples. He would rapidly expand the membership of the Nation of Islam. His oratory skills make him a great speaker, commanding respect in any room that he lends his voice. However, this was not only what set him apart in those times. His physical presence, standing at 6 feet 3 inches and weighing 180 pounds, gave the opulence of power that drove people to him. In 1953, the FBI began surveillance of him, turning its attention from his possible communist associations to his rapid ascent in the Nation of Islam. The American public first became aware of Malcolm X in 1957 after Hinton Johnson, a Nation of Islam member, was beaten by two New York City police officers. On April 26th of that year, Johnson and two other Nation of Islam members saw the officers beating an African-American man with nightsticks. When they attempted to intervene, one of the officers turned on Johnson, beating him so severely that he suffered brain contusions and subdural hemorrhaging. Johnson and the other African-American men would be arrested. Alerted by a witness, Malcolm and a small group of Muslims went to the police station and demanded to see Johnson. Police initially denied that any Muslims were being held, but when the crowd grew to about 500, they allowed him to speak with Johnson. Afterward, he insisted on arranging for an ambulance to take Johnson to Harlem Hospital. Inside the station, he and an attorney would arrange for two of the Muslims to be released. However, Johnson would remain until his arraignment. Considering the situation to be at an impasse, Malcolm stepped outside the station house and gave a hand signal to the crowd. Nation members would begin to leave, after which the rest of the crowd also dispersed, which would be a testament to his public acceptance at the time. On seeing this, one police officer told the New York Amsterdam News, no one man should have that much power. Within a month, the New York City Police Department arranged to keep Malcolm X under surveillance. They would go as far as checking with authorities in other cities in which he had lived and prisons in which he had served time. In October, he sent an angry telegram to the police commissioner after a grand jury refused to indict the police officers that beat Johnson. In response to this, the police department assigned undercover officers to infiltrate the Nation of Islam. In the late 1961, there were intense clashes between the Nation of Islam members and the police in South Central Los Angeles. Many Muslims were arrested, but later they were acquitted. However, these events left tensions running high. In the early hours of April 27, 
1962, two LAPD officers, without any provocation, attacked and beat several Muslims outside a nation's temple. This unjust act angered the Muslims, and a large crowd emerged from the mosque. The officers tried to intimidate them, but things quickly spiraled out of control. During the chaos, one officer was disarmed, and his partner was shot in the elbow by a third officer. The situation escalated when over 70 backup officers arrived at the scene. They raided the mosque and started randomly beating members of the Nation of Islam. The police even resorted to shooting, injuring seven Muslims. Tragically, a man named Ronald Stokes, a Korean War veteran, was shot from behind while raising his hands in surrender, and he lost his life. Another man named William X. Rogers was paralyzed for life after being shot in the back. After this horrifying incident, some Muslims were accused, but the police faced no charges. The coroner even declared the killing of Ronald Stokes as justified, which added to the outrage. Malcolm X, deeply affected by the desecration of the mosque and the violence, felt a strong need for action. He turned to his own troubled past to rally the more hardened members of the Nation of Islam, urging them to seek violent revenge against the police. Malcolm X approached Elijah Muhammad, seeking his approval for this course of action, but to his astonishment, it was denied. This refusal shattered him. Additionally, when he expressed his desire for the Nation of Islam to collaborate with civil rights organizations, local black politicians, and religious groups, Elijah Muhammad blocked him again. This marked a turning point in their deteriorating relationship. Their relationship deteriorated even further when rumors began circulating that Muhammad was conducting extramarital affairs with young nation secretaries. After first discounting the rumors, Malcolm X came to believe them after he spoke with Muhammad's son Wallace and with the girls making the accusations. Between 1964 and 1965, he appeared in several national TV interviews. During these interviews, he provided evidence of his investigation confirming multiple cases of child defilement which were corroborated by Elijah Muhammad himself. He discovered that seven out of eight girls involved had become pregnant as a result. He also revealed a chilling assassination attempt against him when an explosive device was found in his car. Alongside this, he received death threats in response to his exposure of Elijah Muhammad. The strained relationship would be completely broken years later. On December 1, 1963, when asked about the assassination of John F. Kennedy, Malcolm X made a controversial statement. He said it was a case of chickens coming home to roost, and he added that this didn't make him sad, but rather glad. These remarks caused a lot of public outrage. The Nation of Islam, which had sent condolences to the Kennedy family and instructed its ministers not to comment on the assassination, publicly criticized Malcolm X. Although he remained a minister, he was forbidden from speaking publicly for 90 days. Malcolm X had become a media favorite by this time, and some members of the nation saw him as a threat to Elijah Muhammad's leadership. Publishers were interested in his autobiography and in a book written by Louis Lomax about the nation. Malcolm X was featured on the cover, and his speeches were prominently included, while Muhammad's presence was limited. This made Muhammad envious and upset. On March 8, 1964, he announced his split from the Nation of Islam. Although he still considered himself a Muslim, he felt that the nation had reached its limit due to its rigid teachings. He revealed his plans to establish a black nationalist organization to raise the political awareness of African Americans. He also expressed a desire to collaborate with other civil rights leaders, something he had been prevented from doing under Elijah Muhammad's leadership. After leaving the Nation of Islam, Malcolm X founded two new groups. One was called Muslim Mosque, Incorporated, MMI, which focused on religion, and the other was the Organization of Afro-American Unity, a secular organization advocating for Pan-Africanism. A few days later, he would have a brief meeting with Martin Luther King Jr. It was their first and only encounter, which lasted only long enough for photographs to be taken. The meeting took place in Washington, D.C., while both men attended a Senate debate on the Civil Rights Bill at the U.S. Capitol. In April, he delivered a speech titled, The Ballot or the Bullet. In it, he encouraged African Americans to use their voting rights wisely, but warned that if the government continued to deny them full equality, they might have to consider taking up arms. In April 1964, with the financial support of his half-sister Ella Little Collins, Malcolm X embarked on a journey to Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, to participate in the Hajj, the obligatory pilgrimage to Mecca for Muslims. 
However, due to his American citizenship and inability to speak Arabic, his status as a Muslim was questioned upon his arrival in Jeddah, causing a delay. Fortunately, he had a book called The Eternal Message of Muhammad by Abdul Rahman Hassan Azam, which he received along with his visa approval. He reached out to the author, and through the help of Azam's son, he was released and provided with a personal hotel suite. The following day, he discovered that he had been designated as a state guest by Prince Faisal. A few days later, after completing the Hajj rituals, he had the opportunity to meet with the prince. Malcolm X later reflected that witnessing Muslims of various races interacting as equals during the Hajj had a profound impact on him. It made him see Islam as a potential solution to racial problems, as he observed people from different backgrounds coming together in unity. During a visit to Africa, he particularly despised Moise Chombe of the Congo, whom he viewed as an Uncle Tom figure. During a speech in New York in 1964, he referred to Chombe as the worst African ever born and accused him of committing the international crime of murdering Patrice Lumumba. He strongly criticized Chombe's decision to employ white mercenaries to suppress the Simba rebellion, alleging that they committed war crimes against the Congolese people. Upon returning to the United States, Malcolm X condemned the United States for supporting Chambe and what he called his hired killers, the white mercenaries. He expressed his anger about Operation Dragon Rouge, in which the U.S. Air Force dropped Belgian paratroopers into Stanleyville, now known as Kisangani, to rescue white Belgian hostages from the Simbas. He argued that there was a double standard when it came to valuing white and black lives. He claimed that the international community deemed it an emergency to protect white lives, but did nothing to stop the abuses inflicted on the Congolese by Chombe's mercenaries. On December 3, 1964, Malcolm Okox participated in a debate at the Oxford Union Society. During his address, he rejected the label of black Muslim and instead emphasized being a Muslim who happened to be black, reflecting his conversion to Sunni Islam. He purposely minimized references to his religion in his speech to challenge his image as an angry black Muslim extremist, an image he had long detested. At Oxford, he criticized the biased portrayal of the Congo crisis by the Anglo-American press. He pointed out that the Simbas were depicted as primitive and cannibalistic savages engaged in every imaginable depravity, while Chambe and the white mercenaries were portrayed favorably with little mention of their own atrocities. In his speeches advocating for equality and an end to racial discrimination against black people, Malcolm X strongly argued that if the U.S. government couldn't or wouldn't protect black people, they should take matters into their own hands. He believed in self-defense and asserted that he and other members of OBAU were determined to protect themselves and fight for freedom, justice, and equality by any means necessary. During his speeches at the Militant Labor Forum, hosted by the Socialist Workers' Party, Malcolm X criticized capitalism. When asked about his preferred political and economic system, he admitted he didn't have a specific answer. However, he noted that it was not a coincidence that newly independent countries in the Third World were turning towards socialism. When a reporter inquired about his thoughts on socialism, he asked if it was beneficial for black people. Upon hearing that it seemed to be, he responded, Then I'm for it. While he no longer advocated for the separation of black and white people, Malcolm X continued to support black nationalism, which meant advocating for self-determination for the African-American community. However, in the final months of his life, he started to reevaluate his stance on black nationalism after meeting with North African revolutionaries who, despite their appearance as white, fought against racism. During a conversation with Gordon Parks just two days before his assassination, Malcolm X revealed his evolving perspective, saying, Listening to leaders like Nasser, Ben Bella, and Nkrumah awakened me to the dangers of racism. I realized racism isn't just a black and white problem. It has caused bloodshed in nearly every nation on earth at one time or another. Throughout 1964, as his conflict with the Nation of Islam escalated, he faced repeated threats to his life. In February, a leader from Temple No. 7 ordered a bomb attack on Malcolm X's car. In March, Elijah Muhammad, the leader of the Nation of Islam, told Louis X, later known as Louis Farrakhan, that hypocrites like Malcolm should have their heads cut off. The April 10th edition of Muhammad Speaks, the nation's newspaper, even featured a cartoon depicting Malcolm X's severed head bouncing. On June 8th, the FBI intercepted a phone call in which Betty Shabazz, Malcolm X's wife, 
was informed that her husband was as good as dead. Four days later, an FBI informant received a tip that Malcolm X was going to be assassinated. Around the same time, the Nation of Islam filed a lawsuit to reclaim his residence in East Elmhurst, Queens, New York, although his family was ordered to leave on the night before a hearing on postponing the eviction. The house was tragically destroyed by fire on February 14, 1965. On February 21, 1965, Malcolm X was getting ready to deliver a speech at the Audubon Ballroom in Manhattan. In the midst of the 400-person audience, someone suddenly shouted, Negro, get your hand out of my pocket! As Malcolm X and his bodyguards attempted to calm the disturbance, a man rushed forward and shot him once in the chest with a sawed-off shotgun. Simultaneously, two other men charged the stage, firing semi-automatic handguns. Following the tragic event, the shooter, Talmadge Hayer, a member of the Nation of Islam, was beaten by the crowd before the police arrived. Witnesses identified the other gunmen as Norman III, X Butler, and Thomas 15 X Johnson, also members of the Nation. In March 1966, all three were convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison. Malcolm X was shot 21 times with gunshot wounds to the chest, left shoulder, arms, and legs, including 10 buckshot wounds from the initial shotgun blast. He would be pronounced dead shortly after arriving at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. From February 23rd to 26, a public viewing took place at Unity Funeral Home in Harlem, drawing an immense crowd of mourners estimated between 14,000 and 30,000 people. On February 27th, for the funeral itself, loudspeakers were set up outside the Faith Temple of the Church of God in Christ, allowing the overflow crowd to participate. The service was also broadcast live on local television. Notable civil rights leaders including John Lewis, Bayard Rustin, James Foreman, James Farmer, Jesse Gray, and Andrew Young were among those who attended the funeral to pay their respects. Malcolm X was laid to rest at Ferncliff Cemetery in Hartsdale, New York. In a touching display of solidarity, his friends took up the shovels typically used by gravediggers to personally complete his burial. To support his family and provide for the education of his children, actor and activist Ruby D. and Juanita Poitier established the Committee of Concerned Mothers. This committee aimed to raise funds for a home for his family and contribute to the education of his children, ensuring they were taken care of in the wake of their father's passing. With his death, Malcolm X left a legacy that would be forever ingrained in history. Considered one of the greatest and most influential African Americans, Malcolm X played a vital role in boosting the self-esteem of black Americans and reconnecting them with their African heritage. He significantly contributed to the spread of Islam within the black community in the United States. Many African Americans, especially those residing in northern and western cities, found that Malcolm X expressed their grievances about inequality more effectively than the mainstream civil rights movement. In the late 1960s, a wave of increasingly radical black activists drew inspiration from Malcolm X and his teachings. Movements such as Black Power, the Black Arts Movement, and the popularization of the slogan, Black is Beautiful, can all be traced back to his influence. Malcolm X's impact even extended to fictional realms. The Marvel Comics character Magneto was inspired by him, as confirmed by writer Chris Claremont, while Professor X drew inspiration from Martin Luther King Jr. Additionally, the character Eric Killmonger in the film Black Panther was influenced by Malcolm X. Malcolm X stands tall as an extraordinary source of inspiration and a beacon of hope for African Americans throughout history. His remarkable journey and unwavering dedication to the fight for justice and equality continue to ignite the flames of motivation within our hearts. One of Malcolm X's greatest achievements lies in his ability to revive the sense of pride and identity among African Americans. He breathed life into the rich heritage and cultural roots that had been suppressed for far too long. By encouraging his community to embrace their unique identity, he ignited a spark of self-love and empowerment that spread like wildfire. His message resonated deeply, reminding us all that our differences are what make us beautifully resilient. Malcolm X fearlessly confronted the shackles of systemic racism and oppression, fearlessly challenging the status quo. In his powerful speeches and unwavering actions, he reminded African Americans that their voices mattered and their struggles were not in vain. His bold approach inspired a generation to rise above the limitations imposed upon them and fight for their rightful place in society. As always, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos to let more people know the truth about blacks 
and to hear their own part of the narratives. Thanks for watching.